Good morning. Um, I'm going to discuss the brain activity map and the future of neurotechnology. And I'm going to start by talking about uh, what I consider is uh, maybe the most important challenge that science and technology has currently, which is to understand how the cerebral cortex works. So as you uh, probably know, the cerebral cortex uh, is the largest part of the brain in mammals. It covers our encephalon. And it's a thin sheet of tissue about two millimeters thick as illustrated here on the right. Um, but it's actually a flat um, a circuit. Uh, so about two square meters, which in the case of humans is all crumbled up inside our skull, uh, forming what we know as the gray matter, which is illustrated over here, all right? Um, and uh, the reason I think is the most important challenge of science and technology is because uh, we know now from 100 years of uh, patient uh, lesions and animal work uh, that uh, the cortex is actually the site of uh, all the higher cognitive functions. Um, our mental abilities are based in the cortex, are generated by the cerebral cortex. And also uh, alterations, pathologies in the cortex are underlying uh, essentially all the mental uh, diseases and many neurological diseases. So, uh, and at the same time, we still don't understand how it works. In spite of a hundred years of uh, solid work, generation after generation of extremely uh, bright scientists, some of which are illustrated here, um, all over the world. So as a taxpayer, you could say, well, um, where is the, the goodies? How come, you guys still don't know how the cerebral cortex works in spite of all this, this uh, effort. So I'm going to briefly bring you up to date as to what we've learned in the last 100 years and then offer you an explanation as to why we don't understand it and offer you a, a solution as to what we could do to understand the cerebral cortex. And I think the minute that um, science and medicine understand how the cortex work, uh, it's going to be a turning point in our culture because we will understand our minds scientifically from the inside for the first time. So uh, we are defined by our minds, our species is. So uh, it's not only of great medical importance for uh, psychiatry and, and neurology, but it's of fundamental cultural importance for, for us as, uh, as humans, okay? So, um, so what have we learned? I, I think it's fair to say that the central hypothesis that uh, we have as a field in terms of uh, researchers like me that study the cerebral cortex, is that it's built out of uh, repetitions of a modular circuit. And this is um, what I mean in this slide, which means that uh, there could be a, a strip of tissue that may have, I don't know, 10,000 neurons. We, no one knows for sure. But um, the reason uh, that the cortex has evolved so quickly and has expanded so recently in evolution could be due to the fact that it's essentially a developmental program that is duplicating these modules. Uh, if this is the case, uh, different areas of the cerebral cortex will uh, have essentially the same underlying hardware. And this uh, module, as, as the word, the transistor of the cortex, would be the same in humans or in other mammalian species like in mice. And what makes us smarter is because we would have many more of these modules than mice uh, do not necessarily because our modules will be different. So um, now I'd like you to consider the following um, idea. If this is the case, that means that everything that the cortex does is uh, the fruit generated by the same exact uh, circuit hardware. So uh, now if you go to, let's say, uh, the back of the cortex, um, the, it's involved in visual uh, analysis of the, of the world. Uh, if you go to the front of the cortex in human, it's involved in some sort of calculation of probabilities about the future. You go to the uh, temporal lobe, uh, you find uh, some neurons that are responsive to particular faces of particular people that we know. So if you move around in different parts of the cortex, you find that these computations have apparently nothing in common. So uh, at, at the same time, if they are indeed generated by the same structural module, the same functional unit, then um, it is, uh, means that the common denominator for all this computation has to be something very simple. And um, you could argue that uh, what we're missing, what we should be trying to understand is 
what is the computational essence of this module, which I would um, uh, liken to the double helix of DNA. So just like in genetics, there was a simple model, the DNA double helix, which has great explanatory power. I can explain a lot of uh, what happens in inheritance and, and in genetics. Um, you could imagine that the cortical module could be based around some simple circuit, uh, biological Turing machine uh, uh, that can compute anything that can be computed. And that could explain why different parts of the cortex uh, are computing up this apparently com uh, solving this apparently completely different computation. And uh, this would also explain the great, great success of our species and the mammalian lineage in evolution, because we are the, the, the species, the, the lineage that has this biological Turing machine. That's why we've been so successful in evolution. And if you realize that, then you can understand the magnitude of the problem that we're dealing with and how important it is. And it is possible that uh, this double helix of the brain could be, uh, uh, people say, well, it, maybe it's very complicated, but I would argue today that uh, we probably are facing something very simple. And then once we see it, just like it happened with double helix, it will be in a hand moment and people will say, oh my God, it's kind of believe we were looking at it uh, all, all these years. So uh, why haven't we hit on this double helix of the brain yet? And um, what people have been doing uh, for the last hundred years um, is uh, looking at the cortex one neuron at a time. And for that, they've used anatomical techniques such as the Golgi method. So this is an example of a drawing from Ramonica Hall of the typical neurons in the cerebral cortex of a human. These are the pyramidal cells. Uh, and you have some other cells here, which are actually non pyramidal cells, which are the inhibitory neurons. And um, anatomists have been looking at the cortex one year at a time, and physiologists using microelectrodes have also been looking at the cortex, how the cortex works by one year at a time by sticking these microelectrodes next to the cortical neurons in living animals and living uh, humans, and then uh, recording the activity of these single neurons while the animal of the person was performing some sort of behavioral task and then trying to make sense out of this activity. But um, I'd like you to um, perform the following thought experiment. Imagine you are a UFO uh, scientist and you happen to land in New York City and uh, you find this structure in front of you and you want to understand how it works. It, okay, this is very striking. Let me just figure out how it works. And as a good scientist, you proceed to take it apart to its most individual components. And you find out that the imparted building is built out of atoms. And you try to study the atomic structure of the imparted building and try to understand how it works. Well, uh, no uh, matter how long you study the atomic structure of the imparted building, you will not understand, you will never understand what is it built for, what is the function of the building. The reason is because the atoms form bricks and the bricks form floor plans. And it's only once you start looking at the floor plan level and an interaction of these floor plans with humans that you realize what a building is and what is the function of a building. What I'm telling you is that uh, the function of the imparted building is an emergent property. It's a property that is by definition not present in individual elements and only emerges from the interactions between elements or between the structures that these elements build, in this case, the bricks and the floor plan. So now let's go back to the cerebral cortex. Um, now, uh, any piece of the cortex of any animal is built out of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of neurons. This is an example of the primary visual cortex of a mouse. Every one of these little white dots is a neuron. So um, it has been suggested now for, uh, for a long time that maybe um, what we're facing here is also an emergent level functional property. In other words, that these neurons, although we can see them and we can record from them, in reality, they are actually designed to be interacting with many other neurons and together generate states, which have been called uh, neuronal ensembles. They have many names, uh, neuronal groups, assemblies, attractors, uh, signifier chains. Anyway, the name doesn't matter. These groups of neurons, by working together, will build these functional units that on which this, the function of the zero cortex will be built. So um, if you think about that possibility, then go back and, and look at what we've done as a field for a hundred years is we've essentially uh, looked 
looking at this type of um, structure in front of us, we've stuck a, an electrode in one neuron and recorded from it and then tried to compare that recording from another recording from another neuron in another animal with another electrode and then try to compare, essentially comparing atoms uh, from one building to the next. And uh, it's obvious that uh, if there are emergent properties, these neural ensembles, what we need to do is to study them by visualizing or recording the activity of all the neurons, or at least a large majority of them. How can we do that? I think this is the bottleneck of neuroscience that we've, uh, we're facing at the level of circuit neuroscience, the possibility that we're dealing with emergent level properties. We don't have the right techniques to do this. Uh, you can start uh, trying to put more electrodes in it, but uh, even if you put a lot of electrodes, you, you're not going to be able to record from all the neurons and it doesn't seem to me as the logical way to go. Uh, I would argue that uh, one can use light um, to do the job of capturing the activity of um, many neurons at once and visualize the possibility of this uh, ex existence of this emergent level functional property. And uh, light has many uh, advantages. Um, it's in principle non-invasive. It can be used in parallel. So in principle, you could, you could record from many neurons at the same time. And it's also an interdisciplinary platform. Maybe the message I wanted to leave you with today is that this is the time for neuroscience to team up with physics, chemistry, engineering, and essentially build a new set of tools to tackle this problem of emergent properties, which by the way, is not only uh, a, a problem for people interested in the cerebral cortex, but pro it's a problem for people interested in the function of any nervous system of any species. So, so how um, do you build this, uh, these tools? Well, um, I like you to think of the technical problem, which is that in the cerebral cortex, these neurons I pointed out to you earlier are all intermixed. So it's not, uh, here we have uh, some of the uh, inhibitor neurons of the cerebral cortex of the mouse uh, and withdraw them uh, apart from each other so that you can appreciate how different they are. But in reality, they're all on top of each other. So all these processes, their blue dendrites or the red axons, they're in reality on top of each other. So if you want to use light to record or to image the activity of these neurons, you have to do it with two photon microscopy because you need a source of light that can penetrate deep into uh, brain tissue um, and uh, through the nonlinear excitation properties and the fact that these two photon lasers are infrared, you can actually use it as a, as a magic wand to uh, record the activity and record also the structure of these neurons in the middle of brain tissue. And uh, I'm going to play for you a movie uh, in which you will see uh, how once you start using these two photon uh, imaging methods uh, in living tissue, you start to uh, discover all kinds of things. Uh, one of them, uh, as you'll see in a second, is that many of these structures that we're dealing with are actually quite dynamic. Uh, so if you could play the movie, uh, Tracy. So I hope you've, uh, you've seen the movie and uh, realized the power of being able to use two photon microscopy. So um, I would say that the, the goal of our group and many groups around the world is to enter this uh, field of the neurobiology and the neuroscience of neural ensembles by turning this type of drawings that I've shown you from uh, the, the past generations into uh, deciphering these circuit diagrams and trying to find out if we're dealing with some sort of uh, circuit double helix in there. No? Uh, and to do that, uh, using two photon uh, lasers, we need to be able to image the activity of all these neurons to be able to turn them on or off. And finally, something that I call to play the piano, to be able to uh, arbitrarily turn on and off neurons in patterns so that we can actually uh, test whether the patterns of uh, joint activity of this uh, ensemble are uh, functional and actually matter for the behavior uh, and the functional state of the animal. So how can we do that? So I'm going to give you some examples of how you can do, for instance, imaging of uh, circuit activity using two-photon microscopy. And I'm going to point out how in every one of these steps, it's the 
interdisciplinary interactions, particularly with researchers from the physical sciences that have opened the door to neuroscientists to develop these new techniques. So we're really in the hands of this uh, intimate collaboration with the physical sciences. Um, so um, how can you image the activity of neurons? Well, this starts with uh, the work of uh, organic chemists who designed these high affinity uh, calcium indicators, which uh, they change color when they bind calcium. And you can do this either with organic chemistry and now more recently with uh, genetically encodable indicators. And using these calcium indicators, um, we actually found out by chance that you could uh, monitor the activity, the electrical activity of neurons, because as illustrated here in the lower panel, whenever a neuron fires an action potential, these are electrical recordings from a single cell, you can see uh, a calcium increase in the cytoplasm of the neuron because this action potential opens calcium channels and calcium flows in. So the neuron is stained, is labeled with calcium indicators. If you monitor the intercellular free calcium of the cell, you can back calculate when the neuron fired action, action potential. So uh, this was uh, an unexpected finding and enabled us to look at, uh, for the first time at this activity of, of large populations of neurons. In this case, you're gonna be looking at a movie in which we're imaging the activity of 500 neurons in the primary visual cortex of the mouse. And these neurons are gonna be turning red whenever the neurons are active. Uh, Tracy, could you play this? Could you play this movie, please? Okay. So I hope you appreciate how exciting it is to look at the activity of uh, all these neurons, uh, this, you just watch 10 minutes in the spontaneous activity of the circuit and you see these fascinating patterns, uh, which we've studied for years and uh, um, they're really still um, unclear what is it that they do, but uh, they're also present uh, in the awake uh, behaving animals. Um, and that's, I'm going to play you, uh, we're going to play you a couple of movies in which you'll see similar patterns uh, that are occurring in the cortex of a mouse while the mouse is looking at a screen, looking at primary visual cortex of the mouse again. Uh, and you're going to see that these neurons are turning on. Uh, they're going to be turning red when they turn on. And you're going to start to appreciate how they actually, the neurons like to fire together in groups. They don't fire individually. They appear to be forming these potential uh, emerging uh, functional groups I was discussing earlier. So Tracy, if you could play the movie, uh, first movie clip. And now, um, if you could play the second movie. So, um, so I hope you've uh, seen um, how one can actually use these two photon lasers to literally look inside the brain of a way behaving animals and watch the activity using this calcium imaging uh, and using the trick that this calcium imaging reflects uh, the neural firing, you can watch the activity of these groups of neurons. So you can, in a way, um, look into the mind, look into the brain of these animals while they're performing a behavior. And then the challenge is to be able to decipher this. But these um, recordings that I show you um, only uh, uh, were, first of all, recording calcium. And uh, they were also recording uh, the activity of uh, small groups of neurons, uh, 100 to 500 neurons. 
And thirdly, this was uh, imaging the activity in two dimensions. We know um, that neurons uh, don't communicate using calcium, they communicate using voltage. So what we need to do is to image the voltage of the neurons. And this is actually a big challenge today because we still don't have good voltage indicators to be able to perform these type of measurements I show you in a way behaving animals with voltage. And um, the voltage only exists uh, in a short distance from the membrane. It's all called uh, the by length of the membrane. And um, it is uh, therefore very uh, technically challenging to be able to insert into this, the by length into the membrane uh, fluorescent probes uh, that you can use for this two photon imaging of neural activity. Um, I'm going to give you um, an idea of how one can try to do this uh, nowadays. So there's, for instance, uh, development of uh, novel uh, genetically encoded voltage indicators like ArcLight. In this case, it's a collaboration with Vince Pierboni at Yale. And you can use these genetically encoded indicators to measure the voltage in the neuritic uh, spines or in, in dendrites, this illustrated here on the right. Uh, and you can have enough resolution to see single action potential. So maybe using the genetically encoded indicator at some point, we'll be able to make a movie like the one I showed you in an awake behaving animal. No? This is uh, some of the work that is going on now, but still not ideal. I think we really need a big technical push there. No? Um, Another uh, potential uh, method, this uh, would come from actually the, the uh, world of uh, quantum physics, is to use nanodiamonds, small uh, atomic defects in diamonds that happen to be the world's more sensitive material to electric and magnetic fields. And you can actually uh, build these nanodiamonds and couple them, uh, that's the hope, to uh, the memory of neurons so that they can actually be inserted within the device length and measure optically the change in membrane potential electric field uh, across the, the membrane. So this is a collaboration with the work of uh, with Dirk Englund at MIT and Jonathan Owen at Columbia. And uh, maybe using nanodiamonds, this is an example where, where physics could help. Now maybe it's actually the solution to perform this high quality uh, imaging of neural activity in, in a way behaving animals comes from uh, optics uh, or quantum optics. Uh. So um, this was just one problem, uh, how to image voltage. Another problem that I discussed is the fact that uh, uh, we're imaging the activity of these neurons in two dimensions, but the cortex and any piece of the brain has a three dimensional structure. So if you really are interested in capturing these emergent properties, you need to buy the bullet and be able to actually capture the activity of these volumes of cells. And there's a problem with doing this now uh, today because microscopes uh, that are using lasers like these two photon microscopes uh, perform volumetric imaging by serially scanning different layers as illustrated here. And obviously uh, this is a slow method. The more layers you want to scan, the slower you're going to go. So um, we've introduced um, uh, into this problem, the use of special light modulators, which are liquid crystals that can actually paralyze the light. So you take a laser beam, you essentially run it through this liquid crystal, and then using a computer, you can build a, a face mask in which this laser beam gets split into little beamlets, and you can literally build uh, holograms, three-dimensional structures using light with this SLM. So you can write words uh, or draw pictures of Cajal, but more uh, importantly for our discussion today, you can actually simultaneously excite neurons located in different focal planes. And you can then capture the fluorescent from these two neurons, for instance, uh, through the objective and simultaneously image their activity, even though they're sitting in different uh, uh, depths, at different depths. So, um, uh, so we're, we've actually implemented this strategy um, using uh, special light modulators. And uh, what we can do is we can take, uh, start by taking an image of the tissue. In this case, uh, it's a two dimensional image, but it could be a three dimensional image. We identify where the neurons are, we compute the optical center of mass and upload these coordinates onto the special light modulator. And from this point on, the laser beam gets split into hundreds of little beamlets. Each of them targets a particular cell and then we can use a camera to simultaneously image the activity of all these neurons together. Uh, we've done this um, 
and uh, when, we, when we did this, we ran into the following problem, which is we discovered uh, the fact that microscopes in the time of Leeuwenhoek have been built to image things in two dimensions. So even if you excite neurons in three dimensions, the rest of the microscope still will capture the light uh, from a very small focal point, what's called the point spread function of the microscope. So in order to perform this volumetric imaging, we actually had to aberrate the point spread function and change the point, point spread function from something that looks like a little point as illustrated here to something that looks more like a, like a pencil that penetrates the entire tissue. And this enabled us, uh, we performed this using this optical face mask, which we insert um, in the optical path. We can calculate this aberration introduced by the face mask to essentially turn the microscope from a 2D uh, imaging system into a 3D imaging system. And using this, uh, we can actually uh, 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 image the uh, simultaneously um, fluorescence that is present throughout the volume of the tissue. So on the left side, you have uh, an experiment performed with a tissue phantom in which you have two patterns of light. One of them is stable at the focal point, And this one with a conventional microscope, you can all see it. And the other one uh, it actually migrates up and down through the focal point. And as uh, I told you, in conventional mi microscopes with conventional PSF, you can only see this front pattern when it's exactly the focal point. And the minute it sort of moves a little bit up or down from the focal point, it becomes invisible. With our 3D microscope using this, um, this uh, face mask, we can still see this front pattern across this uh, millimeter uh, worth of uh, tissue phantom. So uh, it enables us to essentially capture light that is emitted from simultaneously from the top and the bottom of the sample. This is uh, a tissue phantom. And let me show you an experiment with real tissue. Uh, you can play the movie, uh, Tracy. You can see uh, the activity of the zebra fish in three dimensions. Could you play the movie? This is work done in collaboration with Misha Arens. Oh, okay, it looks like uh, you're not going to see the movie. Anyway, um, so this, uh, what you would see is uh, the activity of uh, 15 neurons in the brain of a larval zebra fish. Um, spontaneous activity, just like I showed you spontaneous activity before of the neocortex of the mouse. Every one of these uh, orange dots is a neuron that's active. And you, uh, the beauty of this movie, you can see the activity of these cells simultaneously in three dimension, in XY, YC, or, um, or XC. No? Um, so uh, this enables us for the first time to perform simultaneous imaging of the activity of, of neurons. At the same time, we're only imaging very few neurons, uh, 50 to 100. And I just told you that we need to uh, bite the bullet and image tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of neurons if we really want to capture these emerging properties. So um, let me touch upon um, another challenge, which is how you can actually turn the neurons on with light. So you, you like to be able to not just to image the activity, to be able to, as I told you, play the piano and interact with this tissue and change the activity, if ideally in a, in a way behaving animal and see how that alters the, the behavior of the animal. So you can uh, do this, uh, again, this is uh, using a trick now, learn from inorganic chemists. These are people that are building solar cells and they use the metal ruthenium uh, to build light antennas. This is an example of a ruthenium light antenna and you can actually couple these ruthenium light antennas to this uh, metal bond to neurotransmitters like glutamate and uh, then you can use two photon lasers to break this bond and release the neurotransmitter and this means that you can actually optically activate the neuron by uncaging this uh, ruthenium uh, glutamate cage on top of the cell. And uh, you shine light on it, you make the neuron fire, you shine more light, the neuron fires more. And this actually corresponds to the opening of glutamate receptors as one would expect. This collaboration performed uh, together with uh, uh, Roberto Cianica, University of Buenos Aires, who's an inorganic chemist. So uh, using these uh, cage compounds, we can actually go um, and then uh, image uh, a group of neurons in the tissue, either in the brain slice or in the living brain, find out what the neurons are, program the laser so that we can go from neuron to neuron, and then 
you can essentially uh, activate the neurons one by one. So now you have the tools to have single cell precision and you can actually turn the neuron one by one using this ruthenium bipyridine uh, cage, taking a page from the inorganic chemist. Uh, you can also use this to turn the neurons off with light because instead of linking glutamate to this uh, ruthenium bipyridine, you can link GABA and you can use this to uncage GABA on top of a neuron and you can use it to map GABAergic receptors along a neuron, or you can use it, for example, to silence neurons. And in this example, we've silenced neurons using uh, this uh, ruthenium GABA compound. In this case is an experiment performed in vivo in which we have a rat that's underlying, uh, undergoing epileptic seizures in collaboration with Steve Rotman at University of Minnesota. And uh, we apply uh, this uh, ruthenium uh, GABA on top of the cortex, just topically applied. And then when we shine light on the cortex, we uncage, uh, we release this GABA and we can stop the seizure for a couple of minutes. So this gives you a feeling for what could be the neurology of the future in which we could use optical methods to turn on or to off neurons and control, for instance, epileptic seizures. Um, Besides um, uh, turning on and turning off, I told you how uh, the ideal would be to be able to play the piano. In other, in other words, to turn on and off at will any neuron in any arbitrary spatial temporal pattern. Because obviously from the imaging, the movies that I showed you earlier, you can appreciate how uh, the essence to the activity of the brain is it's dynamic. It's actually, the activity is never static, it continuously changes. So you have to be able to have tools that enable you to interfere with this dynamic, uh, Activity. So uh, a thought experiment could be to image uh, uh, a pattern of activity. These are three frames in one of the movies that I showed you, and then use optical tools to turn these neurons on in the same order in which we saw them being activated, and then see if that uh, if the ensemble is continuous, if the activity continues the same way that it did in the re in the spontaneous in the animal or during the behavior, and if it if by playing these patterns, we can actually induce the behavior in the animal, we can, we can in a way uh, change the behavior. This will demonstrate that these patterns actually are functionally uh, critical. So um, we're doing this uh, also using these spatial light modulators. Uh, and um, let me show you an example of a recent experiment using uh, an optogenetic construct. In this case, it's C1B1. It's a recent opsin developed by the lab of Carl Dasseroff at Stanford. And um, we've uh, labeled um, hundreds of neurons in the cortex of the mouse with this construct. And then uh, we choose uh, to play the piano with these two neurons. In this case, we're playing the piano with two fingers and we're turning these two neurons are actually located 20 microns uh, off from each other. They're very close to each other. And we can perform this, um, this uh, experiment in which we can fire the two neurons together using this special light modulator, these holographic techniques that I discussed earlier when we shine simultaneously uh, in, onto the two neurons, two laser beams, each focus on each of the neurons and we can fire them together. Or we can fire uh, only the top cell, even if we move the top, the, the bottom pattern a little bit 20 microns up or the bottom cell. So we really have single neuron specificity in three dimensions with, uh, with as little as a 20 micron focal change which gives us hope that you will be able to play the piano in three dimensions using these holographic methods that I described earlier. So um, all these methods that I discussed are methods that have been developed um, by individual laboratories working uh, in collaboration, maybe a couple of labs, but it's really, I would say, amateurish work uh, compared to what we need to do to tackle these emergent level properties. I mean, we still uh, can only image the activity of very few neurons in two dimensions. Uh, we can mostly image voltage. Um, so this led to the proposal that what we need to do in neuroscience as a group is to uh, create technologies that will enable us to tackle this emergent level uh, system of uh, neural circuits. And this proposal was named the Brain Activity Map. And uh, it was proposed together uh, with a group of colleagues that are listed here on the right. And um, we uh, thought that the best uh, strategy for neuroscience would be to um, uh, essentially um, focus 
the work of uh, a large scale scientific project similar to the human genome project uh, that could span over a decade or a decade and a half on three major goals. One would be to develop novel tools to measure every action potential for every neuron in entire brain circuits. And I mean, uh, uh, like uh, in the human genome project, you could imagine starting with uh, smaller circuits like in the mouse, uh, sorry, in the worm that has 300 neurons or 302 neurons, and then moving as we learn this, develop these tools for bigger animals like the brains of flies, fish, mouse, and eventually um, be able to capture the activity in entire pieces of the human brain or human cortex. I'm not talking about imaging the entire brain, but talking about small piece of the brain, but imaging that area with single cell resolution so that you can see in principle capture every spike from every neuron. The second goal, uh, both uh, because we want to test uh, hypotheses and also with the hope of developing novel therapeutic uh, uh, approaches to mental and neurological diseases is to manipulate uh, the activity of every neuron in these circuits to develop novel tools to be able to play the piano with this the circuits um, and again to do that in three dimensions in a way which is relatively complete so you can actually uh, really test uh, uh, if these neural ensembles uh, encompass hundreds of thousands of neurons then you need you're going to be able to need to be able to manipulate the activity of hundreds of thousands of neurons and the third goal is to develop novel tools and novel ways of, of thinking to be able to analyze this immense amount of data that will come out of these these novel methods uh, and not only handle the data, but be able to mine the data and computationally analyze to build models of what the circuits could be doing. And it's at this level where we can actually get uh, more precise ideas of what is it that we're looking for? What are these ensembles, these mysterious, mysterious uh, emergent properties that uh, neural circuits. Uh, obviously these tools will have great um, uh, power and um, they could be misused uh, and because of this we uh, argued uh, in our publications in our papers in our white papers which were submitted to a series of organizations including the white house uh, and as you'll hear later in this uh, series of webinars the white house sponsored the the brain activity map uh, and essentially turned it into the brain Init initiative uh, that you get described by leaders and the idea is that this has to be a public effort. Um, this is too important to leave for the private sector. It has to be the public uh, running this development of this technique and monitoring the development of techniques using ethical panels where representatives from uh, legal profession, ethical uh, experts, and also representatives of the citizenship should uh, have their voice heard so that these technologies are not uh, misused and they, they respect the privacy and they can be used uh, for the purpose of benefiting mankind. So um, our idea um, was that this uh, is now is the right time to do this large scale te technical development. And why uh, should we do this? I tried to describe, to describe some of the scientific goals behind these novel techniques to explore the emerging properties of brain circuits. Uh, this could enable us uh, someone down in the future to decipher the neuronal code, to crack this double helix of the brain, and maybe to solve the connectivity diagrams. And I've discussed also, uh, there could be great uh, advances for medicine, you know, for uh, psychiatry, neurology. Uh, using these novel tools, we may be able to develop novel assays for brain diseases and generate emergent hypotheses for the pathophysiology of many brain diseases. Now it's possible that these uh, brain diseases are not really uh, based uh, at the molecular level uh, or at the cellular level, but um, they are based um, at the circuits or systems level. So uh, applying Murphy's uh, law, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Uh, in medicine, there are molecular diseases, uh, there are going to be diseases associated with synapses, with the individual cells, but there should be diseases associated with the function of emerging properties of circuits or systems. So, and this is something that could come into uh, that could come into um, into medicine from this um, type of uh, novel tool development. And of course, um, having the ability to turn neurons on and off could enable us to generate novel therapeutic methods. Um, I gave you some examples of uh, optomedicine or brain-computer interfaces. 
uh, and this could uh, be used um, right away actually for epilepsy for uh, patients that are paralyzed. There's also um, the potential that these tools could generate a novel technology just like it would happen. It happened already with the human genome. Well, 15 years after the human genome started, the economy got the, the benefit of about $140 for every dollar that was invested into the human genome project. This is uh, the result from the Battelle report. So we would predict that the same thing would happen in neuroscience and it would be just like uh, biotech emerge, genomics emerge from the human genome. You can imagine neuromics or neurotech could emerge from uh, the development of these tools. And finally, I think it's very important that um, this project could lead to the training of a new generation of scientists that are at ease in the physical sciences and in the neuroscience. And these scientists are the ones who can actually push mankind forward in understanding the brain and, and uh, using these tools for, for medicine. So um, I'm going to skip over uh, a, a movie from a colleague and just finish up with uh, how uh, this could be applied to human patients. So uh, right now the movies that I showed you were taken in microscopes that look like this, in big large optical tables. Uh, these are not very easy to put together or to run, but potentially through the use of spatial light modulators, you could imagine miniaturizing these microscopes to the point that they could be portable, they could even be uh, implanted on top of the skull of a human patient. So uh, and even uh, we can imagine how you could even have a non-invasive way of imaging through um, through the skull or through a thin skull or through a, a, some sort of uh, window into the brain of a human patient and be able to actually image the activity of epilepsy in a piece of cortex while epilepsy is going on and use that information to better understand and to be monitor and maybe change the patterns. Uh, you can also image from the inside. So now um, uh, the work of uh, neuroradiologists has developed this novel uh, method that you can insert through catheters through the femoral artery and navigate your way up into the brain vessels. And you can uh, insert these extraducers into the brain tissue without creating a hemorrhage. And you can uh, implant cameras and light guides into the brain and see from the other, from the inside. Instead of looking at the brain activity from the outside, you can actually imagine doing this from the inside. No? Um, and um, uh, this is an example of an epileptic patient in the future, which uh, is taking one of these pills that has a cage compound. Um, and uh, imagine that, uh, as I showed you earlier with a mouse, we were able to stop the seizures in a, in a mouse. Why not stop in seizures in an epileptic patient? Maybe a patient could have this cage compound floating around his brain. And whenever a seizure starts, maybe with a, a bright light source, so you can put it outside its skull and with a one um, organic LED or, or even a portable uh, one, you can then flash this region of the cortex that's undergoing epilepsy and stop the seizure just like we did with a mouse. This could be a neurological, uh, novel neurological therapies for the future. So um, how could um, something uh, like a large scale project uh, take off? So um, we were initiating the brain activity map uh, with our writing, with our ideas and workshops, bring, trying to bring in a lot of our colleagues. And um, we were able to convince um, the White House and administrators of NIH, DARPA, and NSF that this was really important. And they now have started uh, with just about uh, to enter the end of the first year uh, since the project was officially uh, inaugurated by President Obama. And uh, we hope that over a decade or a decade and a half, uh, one will develop these tools and at the end, uh, uh, we will have these um, this, uh, uh, ready available for the entire community and for the clinicians as well. And private foundations such as the Kavli Foundation were essential in triggering and chaperoning this uh, brain activity map project. And uh, we hope that we'll, they will continue uh, um, pushing from the sides and helping the federal government and federal agencies, the, the public uh, money essentially to be uh, spent in a, in, a, in a very effective way by and complementing that with their own funds. And uh, we hope that the industry will also take on a leadership role and particular as they uh, come to understand uh, the enormous um, economical benefits that will be uh, result uh, from this tool building, uh, they will get involved and contribute their own funding for this tool development. I just wanted to finish with a quote from Sidney Brenner, who says that progress in science depends on new techniques, new discoveries, and new ideas, probably in that order. 
that even though as scientists we think that we're very clever and we're testing new hypotheses, at the end of the day, we can only see as far as our tools let us, as our methods let us. And just like previous generations um, um, had these single neuronal tools and they develop the advanced neuroscience greatly, I think we just uh, need to pass the torch to novel generations of people that will uh, use new novel tools to try to explore this emerging level uh, purpose of brain function and hopefully lead us towards the understanding of uh, something as important as the, as the, the, the function of our cerebral cortex and the, the, the functional underpinnings of our minds. And to develop these new tools, um, we think that uh, we need these brain observatories, these large scale um, institutes of public, uh, just like they have in astronomy, where individual laboratories can go there and have access to uh, this very sophisticated, sophisticated method. The same thing should be uh, true of neuroscience, where individual laboratories could go to a national center where they can actually have access to these tools and be able to use it to test the hypothesis of the particular piece of the brain they're studying. Thanks a lot. Now I'm going to be taking questions. Question number one, why we choose mouse for study instead of human? Um, mice can be genetically uh, manipulated. Uh, they're a great laboratory animal and there's a consensus among uh, many uh, labs throughout the world uh, for the last uh, 15, 20 years to use them as a good model for the mammalian brain. And as I told you, if the central hypothesis is that we're dealing with some sort of modular circuit, uh, we can figure out the structure and the function of this circuit in any mammalian species. And then once we understand one piece of the cortex of the mouse, we hopefully be able to extrapolate uh, to the function of the entire cortex of the human. That's uh, the reason that um, people like us are focusing on the mouse. But let me tell you that there are many, many groups around the world uh, that are interested in, in uh, that are studying human and are interested in, in applying these tools for uh, in humans, either tissue from uh, neurosurgical resections or even in, in patients that have informed consent to be able to, uh, to take a peek into the structure and the function of these neural ensembles in, in humans. Um, Next question, how the data generated from this project will be shared? Uh, it's not for me to say uh, how the data will be shared because I'm not running the project. I'm just, uh, I was involved in inspiring the project. But as I told you, we think that it's critical that this is a public run project and that the, the data should be shared openly, just like the, the human genome data. Of course, with the privacy caveats that are necessary to protect uh, the, the individual uh, privacy. You know? Um, this uh, seems to be the way that the public project is being uh, approached uh, and uh, the idea of having these ethical panels is something that also President Obama uh, announced uh, in his uh, inauguration of the project just about a year ago. Um, okay, next question. Um, thanks for the presentation. Do you consider using other primate close to man? Again, I'm just a private researcher interested in understanding how the mouse cortex works, but uh, I have many colleagues that are work with primates and they are already using some of these tools in macaque monkeys, for example. Um, how relevant, now next question. In your opinion, would the studies of connectivity in slices and neuronal cultures? Um, well, I think they will be uh, probably very relevant. We don't know enough yet to, to, to answer this question properly, but it is, um, possible that we're dealing with some sort of very simple double helix, as I was telling you earlier. And if that's the case, it may be preserved in a neuronal uh, uh, brain slice. And um, perhaps some of the functional essence of those microcircuits could be also generated in culture. As you know, there are now efforts to build uh, cortical columns in culture using these organoids, three dimensional cultures. So I'm actually optimistic that this could uh, give us a lot of uh, insight into some of the principles of how these circuits are generated. But again, it's, it's too early to say whether uh, the double helix is something that you would preserve in a culture in a brain slice or whether you need to, to see it in an awake behaving animal. Um, okay, um, from the technique side, is there a major optical techniques that you are looking for? 
uh, yes, as I said, I'm very interested in techniques that enable us to image, uh, to perform volumetric imaging, to image the activity of neurons in three dimensions simultaneously, and also to image as large numbers of neurons as possible. I think that's, uh, we're trying to develop our own solution to this problem, but this is a major problem. Uh, uh, this is a problem where uh, we could use help. In fact, there are other labs around the world trying to solve that problem, but this is a problem where many, uh, I think it's, it's, it's an example where perhaps uh, a focus effort by an interdisciplinary teams of scientists uh, that would have people experts in optics, in chemistry, in lasers, and of course in neuroscience could, could come up with a better method than even the ones that, uh, that we can imagine today. Um, okay. Um, okay. Is a public run project viable within a reasonable period of time? Well, it depends on the on the funding behind uh, the project. Uh, I think when we first designed this project, we were thinking of 15 years uh, of funding uh, on a similar uh, scale as the Human Genome Project, which was uh, $3 billion over 15 years. Um, now, uh, the project started smaller uh, scale last year. Uh, so fiscal year 14, it was uh, funded by $100 million, uh, the, the US project, and the uh, next year is gonna be 200 million project. So it's actually, a, it's not an insignificant amount of money, but uh, I think it, 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 this uh, may need to be ramp, ramped up if, if we really want to tackle this, this problem head on and try to come up with, uh, with uh, techniques that enable us to perform these type of measurements, particularly in, in, uh, in humans. Um, next question, will you be collaborating with international colleagues? Yes, I'm already are, as I told you, some of our closest collaborators are uh, these inorganic chemists that work in Argentina uh, and uh, scientists uh, like us uh, don't really have uh, uh, frontiers. Uh, we work uh, without uh, limits of space or time. We uh, collaborate with people in other parts of the country. In fact, our laboratories are international. They're built with people that come from all over the world. Um, and uh, I think it's only natural that this project will open up to international collaboration because uh, this is how science uh, works. Um, in what format memory is stored in the neuron? Um, I don't know, I'm not sure anyone knows. I think this is one of the open questions in neuroscience. What is memory? How is memory physically implemented in the brain? People have, try to understand this using single neuron, neuron approaches. But um, some other people have suggested that it is maybe these uh, neural attractors, these um, groups of neurons working together, which are the physical implementation of uh, memory, of associative memory. This is, I'm thinking of the work of John Hoffield, for example. So I think this is an open question. Uh, and this is the type of question that one would, could approach once you can actually see the activity of entire neural circuits, because they can actually look to see whether when the animal is, is remembering something, you can try to cap, catch what are the, the ensemble of neurons that are activated during that, that moment and then try to manipulate this. And as actually there's a very recent work um, from a couple of groups around the world uh, who's, who's starting to use optogenetic methods to implant false memories in mice. So this is consistent with the hypothesis that we're dealing with some sort of emergent level code of memory. Um, Eventually, if the code gets cracked, maybe it can help those of us with multiple sclerosis. Um, yes, um, if uh, we understood how um, the motor um, code is implemented by the brain, by cerebral cortex or the spinal cord, we may be able to develop uh, tools that could stimulate neurons in particular spatial temporal fashion and uh, it could help um, patients with multiple sclerosis. Another approach uh, that I described is uh, the use of uh, brain computer interfaces in which you could have uh, some assisted uh, uh, prosthetic devices that could actually um, enable people to have uh, relatively normal uh, uh, lives in spite of having a neurodegenerative disease. So these are of, co of course hopes. Uh, this is still far from reaching that point. Huh? Uh, okay. Um, you have described determinant the activity map of the brain. As you know, uh, 
there is also an effort to determine the structure, the structural map of synaptic connections. Do you think the brain can be understood from the activity map alone, or would it be necessary to combine the information with the structural connector? Uh, this is a great question. Uh, I think all information is good. Uh, there is, we're not in a position where we can turn off, uh, uh, turn down any source of information, and it would be of great um, uh, importance to understand what is the structure of the circuit that we're trying, whose function we're trying to understand. I think um, there is already an effort going on uh, in this direction. It's called Connectomics. It's now uh, more than five years old. There are groups around the world building novel methods to uh, essentially map uh, connections in a, uh, using uh, either electron microscopy or other techniques to trace a connectivity between neurons. And uh, this could give us essentially at some point the, the, the map of the hardware of these neural circuits. In fact, uh, this person that you're looking at the screen, uh, Sidney Brenner, uh, through his, uh, his work in Cambridge in, the, in his lab, they uh, single-handedly decipher the connectivity of the, of the worm of C. elegans. So for those 302 neurons of the worm, we have the connectivity diagram already for more than 26 years. But um, this also shows us the perils of focusing exclusively on the structure. Even though we understood the connectivity diagram of the worm, uh, for the last 26 years, we still haven't figured out how the brain of the worm works, how the nervous system of the worm generates behavior. There's some very exciting uh, uh, inroads into that problem, but still a, a significant problem. And I think it's fair to say that the reason we don't understand this, or part of the reason is because we don't have the tools to monitor the activity of the entire nervous system of the worm at once. If we have that, if we have the complete anatomical map with a complete functional map, then I think would be much better served in our quest to try to uh, to decipher these uh, these properties from the nervous system. I'm afraid uh, we're running out of time. Let me just pick up one last uh, question. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, have these optical imaging methods been tested in the cerebellum? Yes. In fact, uh, you can perform similar uh, uh, imaging from. Uh, uh, awake uh, mice um, from the cerebellum of awake mice using exactly the same methods, using uh, calcium imaging to photo microscopy. And you can even um, uh, build these uh, miniature microscopes and implant them on top of the skull of these mice or actually uh, through the, um, and have um, some sort of um, optical access to the, to the tissue and perform these recordings in animals while the animals are moving in the mice. So um, with this, uh, I'm just going to have to, um, to say goodbye and thank you for your attention.